Let's pick up from where we left the last video at. We'll learn about the symptoms of an apical cyst now. The formation of a cyst typically occurs without any noticeable symptoms, except coincidentally when it's linked to the necrosis of the dental pulp. However, as the cyst grows, the pressure it exerts can lead to certain effects. This pressure may become strong enough to cause the affected teeth to shift, mainly due to the accumulation of cystic fluid. Pain can become apparent in the later stages when this pressure starts to compress other nearby anatomical structures. In such situations, the root apices of the involved teeth move apart, causing the crowns to be forced out of alignment and the affected teeth may become mobile. If left untreated, a cyst has the potential to continue growing at the expense of the underlying maxilla or mandible. How do we diagnose this condition? Diagnosing a tooth with an apical cyst involves several observations and tests. The pulp of such a tooth typically does not respond to electrical or thermal stimuli and results from other clinical assessments usually yield negative findings, except when examining radiographs. Patients may often recall a history of prior pain related to the affected tooth. Typically, a radiographic examination reveals specific characteristics. There is often a loss of continuity in the lamina dura along with the radiolucent area. This radiolucent area generally appears round in shape unless it is adjacent to other teeth, in which case it might appear flattened and take on an oval form. The size of the radiolucent area can be larger than what is typically seen in an asymptomatic chronic apical abscess and it may encompass more than one tooth. Also, we need to remember that radiographic examination alone is not sufficient for a diagnosis. We also need to be able to differentiate a periapical cyst from other periradicular pathologies. Let's see how we can do so. When examining radiographs, it can be challenging to differentiate a small apical cyst from asymptomatic apical periodontitis. Radiographically, they often appear quite similar, making it difficult to positively differentiate between the two based on X-rays alone. However, there are certain indicators that may suggest the presence of a cyst. One such indication is the size of the lesion. A cyst typically tends to be larger than an asymptomatic apical periodontal lesion. Moreover, the continuous pressure exerted by the accumulation of cystic fluid may lead to the spreading apart of the roots of adjacent teeth, which can be observed on radiographs. Additionally, it is important to differentiate an apical cyst from normal bone cavities, such as the incisive foramen. A normal cavity appears separated from the root apex in radiographs taken from different angles, whereas a cyst remains attached to the root apex regardless of the imaging angle. Remember, there are other periapical conditions that can resemble an apical cyst radiographically, such as globular maxillary cysts, lateral periodontal cysts, incisive canal cysts, aneurysmal bone cysts, traumatic bone cysts, and fibrous dysplasia. These conditions should be carefully considered and differentiated from cystic apical periodontitis. Furthermore, it is crucial to differentiate a cystic apical periodontitis from a globular maxillary cyst which develops in the upper jaw between the roots of lateral and cuspid teeth. Unlike apical cysts, globular maxillary cysts do not result from the death of the pulp and may be treated through marsupialization and later enucleation without affecting the pulp vitality of adjacent teeth. Similarly, a cystic apical periodontitis should be differentiated from a traumatic bone cyst, also known as a hemorrhagic or extravasation cyst. Unlike cysts, traumatic bone cysts are hollow cavities lined not by epithelium but by fibrous connective tissue. The treatment approach for a traumatic bone cyst typically involves aspiration of fluid through a small surgical cavity in the bone, enlarging the opening for irrigation and aspiration until the wound fills with blood and finally closing the mucoperiosteum with sutures. Moving on, let's discuss the treatment of an apical cyst. 
surgical enucleation of apical cysts isn't always required. In fact, the majority of cases see these areas of rarefaction resolving after root canal therapy in a significant percentage, ranging from 80% to 98%. Clinical studies on both successful and unsuccessful cases provide strong evidence that certain cystic apical periodontitis conditions can heal following non-surgical endodontic treatment. However, the exact mechanism behind this healing remains unclear and various theories have been put forth. One theory suggests that when an endodontic instrument is introduced into the cystic area, it triggers an acute inflammatory response that might destroy the cyst's epithelial lining leading to resolution. However, this idea is challenged because healing typically progresses from the periphery to the center of the lesion. A second theory suggests that the instrument punctures the cyst's wall, allowing drainage, which in turn reduces the pressure inside the cyst, promoting fibroplasia and repair from the lesion's periphery. These two theories may explain the healing of apical pocket cysts, where the cyst communicates with the apical foramen. However, they don't explain the healing of cysts that don't connect with the apical foramen, known as apical true cysts. For such cases, other theories come into play. One suggests that as the inflammatory process subsides, drainage is established, fibroplasia begins and collagen production increases. The growing collagen exerts pressure that reduces the blood supply to the epithelium by compressing the vascular network in the granulomatous tissue. This in turn causes the degeneration of the epithelial lining which is then removed by macrophages. The current and most likely theory is that periapical lesions are inflammatory responses to the antigen content within the root canal system and the proliferation of epithelial cells is a reaction to these irritating materials. When the source of irritation is eliminated, the immune system gradually dismantles and eliminates the proliferating epithelial cells. As for the treatment plan, non-surgical root canal therapy is typically the first choice followed by periodic monitoring. Surgical intervention is only considered if a lesion fails to resolve or if symptoms develop. The prognosis of the condition depends on various factors including the specific tooth affected, the extent of bone damage and the feasibility of treatment. Alright, that's it for this video. Let's do a quick recap. The formation of a cyst typically occurs without any noticeable symptoms except coincidentally when it's linked to the necrosis of the dental pulp. However, as the cyst grows, the pressure it exerts can lead to certain effects. This pressure may become strong enough to cause the affected teeth to shift, mainly due to the accumulation of cystic fluid. Pain can become apparent in the later stages when this pressure starts to compress other nearby anatomical structures. In such situations, the root apices of the involved teeth move apart, causing the crowns to be forced out of alignment and the affected teeth may become mobile. Patients may often recall a history of prior pain related to the affected tooth. Typically, a radiographic examination reveals specific characteristics. There is often a loss of continuity in the lamina dura along with the radiolucent area. This radiolucent area generally appears round in shape unless it's adjacent to other teeth, in which case it might appear flattened and take on an oval form. As for the treatment plan, non-surgical root canal therapy is typically the first choice followed by periodic monitoring. Surgical intervention is only considered if a lesion fails to resolve or if symptoms develop. Make Torchwell your study buddy to learn anytime, anywhere without carrying a load of books with you. Sign up now and get a free trial.